and thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much for being here. Uh, this this whole idea about responsible digital futures has been something that's been a concern uh, for us. For me, at least, it became a concern uh, after reading as well as watching Tristan Harris's uh, video on TED, as well as watching The Social Dilemma, and uh, some real concerns about how this technology is evolving and the impact that it's happening on us and society in general. Uh, and the biggest question was, how does it affect us as human beings and what the, what the, what, what the effect is gonna be? So uh, that was the genesis of the idea. And my colleagues, uh, Jyoti, who just led us in, the, in that exercise and uh, Akhil and Aryan and I uh, got together to say, okay, let's, let's try and organize an event around this. And uh, just, just to point out, and I think Akhil will emphasize this again, we don't profess to be experts in digital technologies or, or anything like that. We, we are just concerned users about uh, of this technology and concerned about its impact on society. So uh, we want to see this as uh, an opportunity for us all to be co-learners on this journey and to discuss how we might influence and impact the field so that it is humane and does not cause harm uh, to us both at, as individuals and at the societal levels. So uh, with that, welcome, really thank you for being here. And I'll hand it over to uh, Akhil and Jyoti and uh, please go ahead. Jayoti, I'll go after you. Welcome. Okay. Um, that's my college campus, St. Mary's College of California. And I'm one of the co-founders of the U.S. chapter of the International Humanistic Management Association. David, PJ, and others serve with me on the board as co-founders. So thank you, everybody, for being here. I will um, start us off with a very short poem to welcome all of you. It's by John Wellwood. Forget about enlightenment. Sit down wherever you are and listen to the wind singing in your veins. Feel the love, the longing, the fear in your bones. Open your heart to who you are right now, not who you would like to be, not the saint you are striving to become, but the being right here before you, inside you, around you. All of you is holy. You are already more and less than whatever you can know. Breathe out, touch in, let go. Thank you for being fully present, Akhil. Jayoti, thank you for those beautiful words. Uh, my name is Akhil Tirmezi. As uh, my colleague Gerard just shared with you, for the past uh, actually almost six months or so now, I've been part of these conversations with the International Humanistic Management Association family. And, and I'm just thrilled um, that today we have the opportunity to share some of our thinking uh, and learning. And then when we will talk about our design in just a few minutes, um, you, will, you will notice that we are very much looking forward to both creating space for you to have a conversation and then also um, hear your perspectives as well. Um, but for now, we will continue with our quick uh, welcomes. It is now my pleasure to invite uh, my dear colleague, uh, PJ Dillon. She is the president of International Humanistic Management Association's US chapter. And uh, we invited her so that she could just say a few words of welcome and also just, uh, just a little bit about EMA as well. I see many familiar faces uh, on our call today. 
but I think there are some new folks as well. So it'll be just great to, to hear about um, uh, Ima's mission and work. PJ. Thanks, Akhil. Um, I really just wanted to welcome everybody on behalf of Ima um, and welcome everybody for joining us today. And I also wanted to make sure that I send a special thank you to Gerard, Akhil, and GOT for all of the energy, spirit, and the inspiration you pulled together to make today happen. Um, and really without the commitment of uh, people like you who volunteer your time and your energy and your efforts, and really all of our board members um, around the globe that we have uh, in all the different chapters. Um, I represent the US chapter, but we have chapters in many other parts of the world um, and all have you know, um, are starting to build boards and would definitely be looking for support from members globally. Um, but without, without our board members and without people like Gerard, Akil and Jyoti, we really wouldn't be able to offer the opportunities that we do offer. Um, so we're, the International Humanistic Management Association is really committed right, to collaborating, promoting, and educating for humanistic management. Um, we offer a lot of different programs, and I'm sure many of you have attended some of them, things like the Intellectual Shamans, Necessary Conversations. We also have a Humanistic Management Lunch and Learn, and we have a really strong PhD network um, that allows us to work with doctoral students and junior faculty uh, to help them build their expertise and knowledge around humanistic management. And we're also part of the UN Prime Working Group. And one of the things I wanted to invite everybody to do today is to think about how you might like to participate with EMA in the future, right? We're always looking for help um, and guidance and your inspiration in terms of helping us to organize the programming and develop new programs. So what I wanted to do is make sure to invite anybody who's interested to reach out to myself or any of our board members um, that you'll see in, in many of these conversations uh, and see how you can um, get involved with us and help out. I'm also gonna post in the uh, chat room, in the chat, uh, the website there, if you wanted to check out the EMA website. It really is a great group of people. And as Gerard, Akil, and Jyoti have mentioned, it is like a family, right? We have a really good time and we really enjoy sharing our energies with each other. Um, and it makes it a really special way to do service within the community. So just wanna invite you all to check out EMA, see how you can get involved. And I'll hand it back to Akil, I think. Thank you very much, PJ. Thank you for joining us today uh, and for this very warm welcome. Okay, so let me just um, take you know, a couple of minutes here to um, give you all a quick sense of how our next uh, almost three hours sort of um, structured in terms of um, flow and activities. But um, before, before I uh, go into some of the sort of, you know, uh, flow and activities that we're envisioning, I'm just going to emphasize what, uh, what uh, Gerard said earlier. Um, uh, I mean, digital technology is, I think one of those phenomena, which whether we like it or not, um, pretty much several times every day that we exist, we experience it in, uh, in some way. Um, so yes, we should be concerned about it as, as scholars, we should be concerned about it as experts, but we need to be concerned about it as citizens uh, as well. Um, so I think when we were having these conversations, we were definitely having these in the spirit of, we are co-explorers as we think about some of these um, really significant issues of our, of our time. Um, so uh, in terms of our next steps, we have a few short presentations where, um, where we just wanted to give you just a quick flavor of that as we have wrestled with some of the themes that we are talking about today and held our own conversations from our lenses, perhaps our disciplinary training, where we sit, um, this is how we see those uh, issues. 
Um, and then there will be four of these short presentations. And then between these presentations, we, we have created a little bit of space just for some quick reflections and, and, and comments. And we, of course, encourage you to, to use our chat function over here to put those reflections, uh, reflections in. Um, so that will be uh, approximately our first 45 minutes to, a, to, to, to an hour. Um, so in addition to these three presentations, we'll also have uh, a, a conversation and uh, exchange uh, with a colleague from Center for Humane uh, Technology. We just sort of, you know, bring in, bring in the applied perspective. That will be followed by a quick break. I think we'll be, we'll be, we'll be ready for that uh, uh, afternoon here in the US, uh, but folks in Europe, it's evening for you. And then I think there's someone from India on the call today as well. So I think we'll all need a little break. Um, after that break, I think there'll be a, a, an, an, an opportunity to go in small groups. Um, and then we will provide a few questions to sort of maybe help us think through some of the themes, but that will also be space where given your own lived experience, your own wisdom, your own uh, lens, we are encouraging a sharing of ideas. And then we have also then created some, um, some, some, some time to make sure that we hear about, at least we get some flavor of the kind of conversations um, that would take place in those small groups. And then uh, with that report report out, uh, we will do a sort of a, sort of like I say, a, a high level exchange of reflections and move towards our wrap up. So that's what the plan looks like. Let me quickly uh, check in with uh, Gerard and Jayoti if they have any additions uh, before I invite our first speaker. Okay, I think Gerard, Gerard is on mute, but I think he's saying all, all is sounding good. That's, I think that's what he's saying. <laughs> that's exactly what I said, Akil. <laughs> Thanks for pointing that out. Okay, uh, okay so uh, I'll start off with my first presentation. So let me share my screen with you. Uh, okay, can you see that? Uh, one moment. Yeah. So uh, as you can see, I've kind of highlighted the word responsible here. And uh, that is, that's the fundamental question. Uh, on one level, we know we're going to have a digital future, whether we like it or not, that's a given. But the question is whether it will be responsible or not. Uh, you might feel at the end of this that I take a very dystopian view of the world. I don't intend to do that, but uh, kind of present what what I see as the reality that that is out there. And, uh, and while we need to find positive ways to move forward, we need to recognize what's happening right now. So without much uh, further ado, I'm going to move on. Um, so some kinds of questions, what is the likelihood that companies in the digital space will adopt sustainable practices? Uh, what, what do those responsible practices really mean? Uh, what would companies, uh, why would companies adopt these practices? And what impedes the adoption of these practices? So I'm kind of try and fo focus on these types of questions as we go along. So some background to start with. Uh, I'm gonna read these out word for word because I think they are important. It literally changes your relationship with society, with each other. It probably interferes with productivity in weird ways. God only knows what it does to our children's brains. Uh, it, it's a social validation feedback loop, exactly the kind of thing that a hacker like myself would come up with because you're exploiting a vulnerability in human psychology. The inventors, creators, it's me, it's Mark Zuckerberg, it's Kevin Systrom on Instagram, it's all of these people. We understood this consciously and we did it anyway. Uh, these are the words of Sean Parker, the founder of Napster and later the president of Facebook or the ex-president of Facebook in his interview to Axois in 2017 uh, and kind of represents some of the issues that insiders in the field are really talking about. Uh, some more background. And once I began working at Facebook, it became apparent to me over time 
that there were conflicts of interest between what was in the public's good and the profits of Facebook, and that Facebook consistently resolved those conflicts by prioritizing profits over people. I thought kids' lives were at risk and that Facebook was responsible for ethnic violence in other countries. These are the words of Francis, Francis Haugen, Facebook whistleblower in a Center for Human Technology on an Undivided Attention podcast. Um, what are the issues here? Uh, Tristan Harris has called it the race to the bottom to attempt to, to get to lower and lower on our brain stems because of a competition for attention. So as these firms compete for our attention, they, they want to find ways to entrap us and spend more and more times. It's also called the competition for eyeballs and things like that. Um, question is, what is the product that they're selling? And we get into this a little bit. Who is the customer? And, and this is obviously an industry with an, an insatiable appetite for data as we have experienced and continue to experience uh, today. I just generally drew a broad business model of, of, of the industry, which kind of uh, too much to explain in the short period of time that we have, but essentially it is a model driven by the competition for attention and surveillance of, uh, of people. Um, so the business model, again, some more comments on it. This is from Shoshana Zuboff, who's proud in my, in, from my perspective, one of the people who understands this, this issue more deeply than anyone else. Please take a look at her book. We are not, we are not simply users. We are much used. We have to awaken our shareholders. Uh, we have to awaken to our shared future. Where, where do users stand as stakeholders in this context? The italics is what I added in there. Um, what is the potential? We've often heard of the both and approach in sustainability in other fields. So what is the both and approach in this context? Is, are the two, is it really possible to serve society and with a business model of this kind to actually make a difference? Uh, do, does the business model stand without the competition? Can this business model survive without the competition for attention and, and surveillance? And what are the alternatives? What are the effects of regulation? How do most, for, I'll give you my experience with this. You know, with GDPR, we get, keep getting warned about cookies and would you to pay attention to it? Most of the time, I don't have the energy or the time to go and explore what the rubles are, et cetera, et cetera. So I just accept it. So how many of us actually do that? I don't think I'm atypical in that context. So we don't pay enough attention either to our own privacy and our own and how we are being used in this perspective. Because it's hard, it's complicated, and, and the language is something that is really hard to navigate. So What's the potential future? One is we know that there are tensions between this idea of, of being profitable at one side and, and meeting and being conscious of the effect on society and, and people on the other. Uh, change of business model will be extremely difficult. This thing is already embedded in place today in society. Where is it going to go from there? Uh, what is the future in a world where we find it hard to distinguish between truth and lies? What are our children, how are children going to see this when they cannot really distinguish? And how, what meaning are they going to give to it? Uh, well, again, we talked about government regulations and the effect of that. And th the other aspect to this is the, the industry and the technology moves much faster then, then most of us who are outside the industry can comprehend. So how can regulations be used to, to regulate something that we don't even understand that well? At least those the regulators don't understand very well. Uh, and compensatory models, often it's said, oh, wow, it's done so much good. It helps people reduce poverty. It tracks people, immigrants who, who are lost and they're able to find each other. I think the real question is, yes, there is good and we want to keep the good, but 
do compensatory models, because it does this good, should we tolerate the harm? I think that's a big question for all of us to think about. Uh, what's the role of social activism in this? Notice again that social activism has been both positive and negative. The, uh, the Arab Spring was attributed to the to social media being used as a medium to do it. But on the other hand, we also see what social media does to us. Um, so unless there is a change of heart, which will call for unified, consistent change across competing companies, what is the future? Is that really possible? Because remember, the competition for attention, race to the bottom, there's always that question of whether we'll get there. There are some approaches. Uh, you might be aware there is this movement to words zebras and not unicorns, specifically not unicorns, which are representative of the very fast growth industries in Silicon, companies in Silicon Valley. So the zebras are seen as a counter to that, uh, as a way of focusing more on, on users and making users owners rather than focusing on shareholder primacy. Um, there is the idea of making our data uh, and the right to it, the 31st human right. Uh, there's a company called humanity.co who's, who's very involved in this and has apps which you can purchase actually that gives you control of your own data. Uh, and, and you can monetize it. Uh, there's company like, uh, companies like DuckDuckGo and Craigslist who claim to make, uh, to, to, to not use our data uh, commercially and sell the data. So, so you have these, these possibilities. But here's the key question. Uh, are these efforts strong enough to tip the scale towards a responsible digital future? And I'll stop there. If there are any very quick questions, let me stop sharing. Uh, any quick questions before I pass it on to Jyoti or comments? I see a question from Joel. Joel, you want to talk about it? I think you have to the tension between um, what, what, you know, the, the, the data privacy yeah, yeah, I, and, uh, yeah. and, sh and shareholder value uh, or sh uh, shareholder primacy, I'm sorry. Uh, and I was wondering, you know, if the tension deeper than that is between our privacy and our intentionality and purposeful intentionality and you know the god of convenience <laughs> that is very powerful in a complicated world I, I think you're absolutely right uh and so some of the questions in relation to that is uh is convenience whose responsibility is this right make it more convenient but then you know what's the what's the effect of that? So I I agree with you. Yes, that's definitely a a key question. Any others? Any other comments? Or, I think I Ravi is raising his hand. Ravi, go ahead. Yeah. Hi, Ravi. I, I would I, I would see this more as a deja vu when nuclear energy was first invented. Uh, you know, people said it has both positive and negative uses. It's almost like a, a knife. Knife is a tool, and uh, it can put to good use or bad use, and it all depends on the user intentions. If you have a bad user, then bad things happen. If you have a good user, then good things happen. So I think the solution and trying to make everybody responsible depends upon, I think, having the right values uh, mm -hmm. driven into the mindsets of people. And I think the larger mission, I think David is more eloquent in uh, mentioning this about love, trust, doing good, social good, commons, uh, contributing to the society, all the positive aspects. If they are more focused and emphasized in everything that we do think, uh, do and think, I think there'll be more responsible use of digital technology. Uh, and that is reduce the, so it all depends upon the user. That's all I want to say. Yeah. It's more uh, like the nuclear, nuclear uh, and, uh, invention, nuclear energy. Yeah, I, I think that there's also the question of the provider, 
and what the provider does in in this uh, in this context. Um, yes, the user is important, and we have power. But is that power real? Can we really exercise it? I think those are questions that we need to pay pay a little more attention to. Uh, do we have? Yeah, I think we have time for one or two more comments or questions. Thank you for that, Ravi. Any others? Okay, I don't see any hands up. So let's move on, Jyoti. Uh, Jyoti is, has been our partner in, in, uh, in creating this workshop. And uh, Jyoti, just introduce yourself and, and go ahead. Thank you. And I Thank you, Gerard. I'm gonna share my screen and go through um, some slides based on my experience of how the digital futures impact us as academics and um, our lives. Um, so thank you, Gerard, for setting up at the societal level. And now we can take a deep dive in the part of society that we are most familiar with. But before I do that, I want to say a shout out to Michael Pearson, who's in the room. Those of you who are new and don't know him, he is the founder of International Humanistic Management Association, as well as Humanistic Management Network before that, and literally has enabled hundreds, if not thousands of us to be heard, to be able to do what we do and to connect us all, um, which is where the power is in the community. So thank you, Michael, for being here. Thank you all for being here, for doing this. I'm saying hello my vacation place with my kids in the background, so I'll be off camera, but thank you all. This is a very important topic. And in the private message, he said, think about a special issue. So all of you who have ideas about digital futures, keep notes and maybe we will have enough people interested to create a special issue of the Humanistic Management Journal. So I'm gonna talk about educating digital natives and changing roles of institutions of higher education and society. The college I'm at, which you see in the background, St. Mary's College of California, 153 year old liberal arts college in Silicon Valley. I teach in the executive MBA program, have done that for 22 years now and have been online for 22 years. Many people are surprised to hear that, but yes, online classes and instructions have been a normal part of life for many of us for uh, several years now. Um, and often when I go to conferences at the Academy, Western Academy or other places, um, and I talked about digital pedagogy starting in 2014, um, most of the reaction I got was, can't be bothered with that. You go do the online thing, nothing replaces face-to-face. -face. Um, I'm gonna make an assertion right up front that we are in the middle of a punctuated change. And this is a model first proposed in biology by Stephen Gould that rapid change happens in short bursts of time. And we might be in the middle of one is my conjecture. I'm gonna talk, you know, Gerard has set us up with talking about societal level digital futures. I'm gonna explicitly focus in the five minutes or so I have on students, pedagogy research, what it means for faculty in higher education. Um, just at the high level, in addition to what Gerard said, I think many of us in the room will remember Encyclopedia Britannica, which was the reference source to go to um, when we were students and the colleges we are at currently are still set up in that model. Whereas our students and society at large has moved on to Wikipedia where anybody can create the entries and anybody can access it at their fingertips. So how knowledge is distributed has radically changed. So within that context, um, some other things have changed. In my experience growing up, generations was family related term where my grandparents or parents and children were the generation gaps and things we discussed. 
now it's very common to hear of the boomers or the millennials or Gen X and Gen Z. So our identities have shifted from being centered in our families to our identity as consumers who will buy what and what, how can we segment the humans into consumers that we target. And the institutional impact of that is that the connections that used to be, you know, many connections that each one of us might have or one to one connections to many groups and many to many connections. Anybody can teach anybody anything. Um, so that's sort of at the broad level. Let me talk about students who I call digital natives to remind myself that they're not the same student that I was and their experience is different. Even though I go to a classroom on campus that looks rather like this. We've been there on that same location for over 80 years now. So, and I'm thinking most colleges I've visited around the world, the classrooms still look like that. Maybe a few more screens and an overhead projector, but that's the model. But if you have kids, they're probably going to school in settings where they're learning very differently. It's much more individualized, much more screen centered. Um, and for about 20 years, my students have attended my online classes in addition to the face-to-face -face class through wherever they happen to be. If they're traveling in Europe in the middle of the night, they will get up and attend a class or sitting in a cafeteria somewhere. So that's where learning is happening. I find that these students, the digital natives, are very plugged into World Wide Web. If I make an assertion, they are immediately checking online and finding related mm -hmm. Google answers about is she right or not. And they have 1,500 friends on their social network, but they're very, very isolated. Having a conversation is a challenge for them. Getting a phone call freaks them out if it isn't preceded by a text to say, may I call you? Because that's their lives. That's what's normal for them. What implications does that have for pedagogy? For them, virtual and real is no different. It's different for me because for me, virtual is not real yet, but for them it's, and that means that their learning style is much more media savvy and they consume a lot more information and it's always on literally 24 seven, which didn't used to be a word before. And the pandemic has just accelerated that. And it has accelerated that for pedagogy as all of us have now gone online too. So, so one of the things that I do in my class is to build community, to literally have them have conversations uh, and get to know each other. And um, I've also found that their attention span is a lot lower. We used to talk about soundbite 20 years ago, and now it's a meme that's about the level of their attention span. But in one of my roles as a journal editor for an online journal of Emerald Emerging Markets case studies, I found that we were still distributing case studies as they were written on paper and calling them online cases. But really online cases are students bringing up the CEO's video clip talking about the same issue, which is so much more powerful than having them read a quote by CEO on paper. So I had to adapt and go to multimedia case studies, but our institutions don't support that. And our research is not rewarded for curating content from the World Wide Web. So we need to change institutions. Um, and pedagogy has changed radically. And COVID has just accelerated that, as I said. And that has implications for how you design your course, what you prepare before and after class and in-class practices. Many of you have experienced that now. And Gerard was mentioning to me in our preparation that one of his colleagues has written a wonderful essay saying, it's a missed opportunity if we just move our class online because it really has to be designed differently. Some content is more suitable for online delivery, others, content is much better done face to face and thinking through the course design is one of the challenges that we all need to embrace and um, you're all familiar with the many different kinds of technologies that are available in addition to zoom with you know whether it's Moodle or Canva or infographics um, discussion boards wikis um, many many different ways of connecting 
So I have gone to much more experiential methods and brought in, as I did at the beginning of this session, you know, the physical part into everything because digital presence can be disembodying in some ways and our body has a lot of wisdom and that embodied knowledge needs to be brought out and acknowledged. So um, theater games, improv, poetry, and other ways of acknowledging um, has been some of the things that I've used in my classroom and taught to many other professors at the Academy and Western Academy and Indian Academy of Management in how to do in their classrooms. And the students have really appreciated that. Students say that this is wonderful. They've not had a chance to have classes like that. And I don't have the problems that some of my other colleagues have of students copying and pasting homeworks or, you know, doing things from Course Hero and knowing what the tests will have, uh, using Turnitin to catch them for plagiarism, because I'm taking them through experiences and saying, write about it and reflect on your experience. And that is original. There is no copy and paste for that. Uh, so that's been my journey in my classrooms, but there are many, many choices that technology has enabled. You know, Bill and Melinda Gates students were learning from Khan Academy, and Khan Academy has enough money to have started a physical school in my neighborhood here in the Valley. We've all done, you know, training for traffic school or um, Boy Scouts youth protection or sexual harassment at work or inclusivity that are webinar-based trainings. We've heard of the massively open classrooms. One of my colleagues from IAM Bangalore teaches one class online and has 40,000 students, which is more than what I might have taught in entire 20 years of teaching. So it, there's many, many technological choices. So pedagogy affects each one of us differently depending on what we embrace. And if you want to be teaching MOOCs, there are platforms like Udemy, edX, Coursera, where you can take your content and reach hundreds of thousands of students immediately. So the role of faculty is not just to be an expert in your content area if you're an OB professor or strategy professor and have pedagogical knowledge on how to deliver that to students, but now also technological knowledge of how to moderate discussion groups, how to run Zoom sessions, how to do you know many other technology related demands that are placed on us. That's a big change that has crept up on us that we need to embrace and deal with and change norms to acknowledge, to say that's work. How does that affect our research? Well, predatory journals was not a term. Uh, but now there are so many that good research and fake research have muddied the water and to find what's real content is a challenge. And you need people who are experts, the kind who wrote in Encyclopedia Britannica to be able to tell. The first one to raise the alarm was a librarian, Jeffrey Beall. His site was hacked by the hackers who were running the predatory journals to say can't expose us but now we've publishers have risen up and understood that it threatens their business models so um, research has become much more challenging published papers that were fake peer reviewed and pay for publication had to be retracted by reputed companies that were behind some of this so it's that difficult to track what's real knowledge and what's not. And having served as a founding editor at the Emerald Emerging Markets case study collection, I know that it has phenomenal power. You know, I had case studies from Africa, from China, from India. I taught people online how to write good case studies and enabled much more diverse voices to be included. So while there are alarms to be raised, there's also really good things that are happening, not just because I was doing it, but many colleagues who were working with me, you know, and we are not, we're able to talk and talk about special issue on this because we are connected through uh, digital technologies. So we need to, as higher education and faculty, really the brains on campus start these conversations to say, what is our value proposition? I'm not going to get into the issue of the administration versus faculty battles and I'll assume shared governance and that if we start conversations, we will have an impact on how things shape up. 
at the meta level, philosophical level, I think our value proposition has changed from being the bearers of expert knowledge who pour knowledge into the heads of students as we pour tea into empty cups that come into our classrooms. That model needs to be rethought and the very purpose of education now becomes to help each individual find and listen to the drumbeat of their own heart and to help develop the individual so that they can find their own purpose and their own creative potential and navigate their world with that intention um, and be able to claim their individual individuality and human potential. Um, so I've shared how I do that through project-based learning, through gamification and simulations and experiential exercises. Traditional paper-based learning still continues. I still recommend books and articles, and I still write books and articles uh, and use things, but those I see to be less and less important going forward. And Salman Khan of Khan Academy has a podcast and a YouTube video on projecting higher education into 2060. And he seems to represent my experience and uh, have forecasts and predictions based on that. Within business schools, our job used to be to create corporate um, trainers, as, you know, training. We were training for corporate jobs. If you landed a good job with a Google or a Facebook, we patted ourselves on the back to say, our school's doing well because our students are getting placed at great schools, uh, great companies with great jobs. But early alarm bell has been sounded on that by this book saying, you know, those, those jobs are not real jobs. They're not really adding value to society. And um, in the Valley, more and more, I see that there is moonlighting work, there's gig economy, and most of the thriving companies in the sharing economy, whether it's Airbnb or Turo, and they're based on a very different model. And they don't have the traditional career trajectory of a corporate employee. It's much more, what is your portfolio? What have you done? Show me. And the value of the degree has eroded. Uh, our enrollments are down. Um, and I think other institutions are facing the same thing. Smaller colleges have closed down. Bigger research universities are acquiring them and consolidation is happening in the industry as we speak. So we really need to rethink our value proposition. One solution of what our role is, is Sandra Waddock's uh, book on laying out a critique of our traditional career paths and institutions to say, you know, those early mavericks were on to something. We academics can be intellectual shamans who will heal the society, who will connect and be the spiritual leaders and sense makers in these times where so much is changing so rapidly and our theories and disciplines are out there we just need to make the connections so i'm sure many of you have ideas and thank you for being here to connect um, and starting these necessary discussions to break the iron cage of institution because together we can literally fly with the cage we can pick up the nets we are involved in and fly um, and bridge the skills gap and the rules gap and say, you know, we need to do things differently and find solutions that work for us. Um, so at the metaphor level, you know, the muddied water of murky research, you know, many different forms of communicating towards bringing clarity is our job, is part of trying to become a faculty member who has a job to even at a teaching school to sense makers and community builders and connectors so that we go from melting pot to a mosaic where each identity and unique perspective is valued and connected in meaningful ways. Um, so humanized education is the punchline so that each one of us can lead others in community through self-discovery and self-expression. And that's Gandhi, as a young barrister trained in England, working in South Africa, um, adopting the garments of a uh, poorest of poor Indian to say, that is my purpose to help liberate India to be a free nation. And I will dress like 
a poor Indian till my country is free to become the father of the nation, because how we live our life is our true message. You know, we don't have to have the knowing doing gap if we are being who we are to be in this much more complex world that's changing very rapidly. And there's this moment of tipping point or opportunity. So I'll close with the questions that we'll come back to discussing more when we get to our breakout rooms and things and leave you with, you know, thinking about what you want to bring to changing this and what conversations and discussions you want to start and how you want to be. Um, the African proverb is if you want to go fast, go solo. If you want to go far, go together. So thank you for being here to go together and enabling all of us to be doing this. And with that, I will pass it on. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, any quick questions? Because we need we need to move on. So as we move on, uh, Akil. Is Akil here? Akil is here. <laughs> and just want to make sure that those of us who need a few seconds to you know put a question out there yeah. or a comment out there, they get those three or four seconds as folks are, I'm sure, absorbing and reflecting on uh, what Jayoti just shared. Okay, so of course, you know, as the conversation moves forward, there would be an opportunity to, you know, um, by design, go back to um, uh, what we are all, all sharing. Uh, and I'm sure that in small groups also, um, folks may go back to, uh, to, to some of the things that Jayati just presented. So with that, I am also going to um, share my screen. I, I, I think I have about five or six slides. I'll try to keep it to 10 minutes. Uh, or less. Um, and then we will decide either about a break, um, depending upon our well-being needs. Uh, so, so, so we will do that. But in the meantime, I hope you're comfortable. I hope your feet are planted um, in a way uh, that you're a little relaxed, move your shoulders uh, if necessary, drink some water as needed. So here we go. So I believe it was um, Isabel who said in our chat in the, in the very beginning that um, this is all very overwhelming, right? And it indeed is <laughs> very overwhelming. Um, and as I think we were having our own, own conversation, our good challenge was um, where should we focus on, uh, you know, given the sort of depth and breadth of what we are dealing with when it comes to this theme of uh, responsible digital futures. Um, so I think uh, you will see that, um, as, I, as I also shared with you in the beginning, that we are all sort of, you know, using our own uh, lens and also trying, trying to sort of add to our conversation a little bit. So that I think as I was thinking about some of this and doing my own wrestling, I decided to focus um, today on the sort of em emerging movement, if you will, of public interest technologies and some of the sort of potential that they that they uh, offer. But let me start with a little bit of background that my colleagues have already talked about. So hopefully a couple of things that I'll say over here will further emphasize or maybe in a small, small way add to what you have already uh, heard. Um, going back to, I think it was Ravi's comment, right? That it's about the, about the user and then Gerard said, yes, it is but then you know, there is more there. I think one way to think about what is more there as we think about um, how quote unquote users are being treated to sort of bring the humanistic element to that, right? Focus on the user's humanity, if you will. My colleagues have talked about the potential of, um, of everything that this technology offers. And of course, folks on this uh, call, um, 
that's not hidden, that's very uh, obvious. But I think at the same time, every now and then a reminder is, is, is needed. Um, digital technology really has been a force of disruption, disruption in a positive way in so many spheres of our lives, ranging from uh, learning that uh, Jayoti touched upon, uh, healthcare, as many of you are uh, aware, finding friendships and love. Look at all the, all the apps that we have developed in the last uh, couple of decades uh, focusing on that. Advocacy, uh, entertainment and how we access it today. Uh, potential to collaborate that just did not exist uh, before in some of the sort of regional or uh, uh, national movements um, are considered successful because of that connectivity that technology uh, offered. So in that sense, um, just, you know, I, I, you know, I wanted to emphasize that uh, we need to recognize this potential whereby actually digital technology can um, and has elevated our humanity. Our humanity. Um, at the same time, uh, we are familiar with you know, not very well-known and also very well-known cases of how digital technology has been, has been used to degrade, disgrace, and victimize humanity. We are familiar with examples of um, killing of journalists where their phones were uh, uh, hacked, harassment of uh, political uh, opponents, and just in, um, in, in, in general, stealing of our intimate uh, information. So then, therefore, again, going back to a, sort of, uh, you know, a participant comment, there's this tension there, right? That how do we navigate um, the potential and some of the sort of uh, very significant harm that we've already uh, seen through, through examples all around the world um, so that we can bring more responsibility as we, as we move forward. So this is where and I, I decided to focus a little bit on the public interest technology movement, which I'm sure that uh, some of you are familiar with. Let's just start with a with a sort of a quick definition, if you will. Public interest technology refers to the study and application of technology expertise to advance the public interest in a way that generates public benefits and promotes the public good by deliberately aiming to protect and secure our collective need for justice, dignity, and autonomy, PIT asks us to consider the values and codes of conduct that bind us together as a humanity. New America is, um, is one of the important players in this, in this space, and they are colla collaborating uh, with a couple of uh, foundations over the last few years to uh, cultivate and grow this movement, if you will. So what are some of the building blocks of uh, PIT? Um, one of those building blocks is commitment to finding, securing, and making strategic cross-sector investments. Since 2016, for example, Ford Foundation has invested close to $100 million in this movement. And then we are beginning to see some fruits of that that I'll come to just in a second when I move forward over here. Uh, there's a very clear emphasis on interdisciplinary uh, engagements within sort of entities, for example, organizations and across entities as well. Then to grow this uh, movement, as was the case with the, some other successful movements, we need uh, mavericks, we need organizational leaders and cases and, and, and examples of this is possible. We are trying, we are learning, and we are making improvement and we can do it. My colleagues and some of you in the chat has talked about policy and regulation that will re you know, remain forefront of all efforts in this regard. And PIT is very sensitive to that, to that as well. And then uh, finally, uh, in terms of different sectors, academia has a very important role to to play here as well. And then I'll specifically talk about an initiative. So in the next three slides, I'll just give very quick examples of an organizational exemplar, if you will, a little bit about policy regulation and academia, and then, uh, and then close this part of our discussion today. So um, uh, Gerard mentioned GDPR, uh, step in the right direc direction, but, but obviously, um, not uh, 
not sufficient, right? So some of you may have now heard about the, you know, the sort of, you know, emergent conversation around the AI Act on the other side of the Atlantic. Um, a group called Future uh, of Life Institute has been sort of watching some of this conversation and documenting it. And here is a quote from them. The AI Act is a proposed European law on artificial intelligence, the first law on AI by a major regulator anywhere. The, the law assigns applications of AI to three risk categories. First, applications and systems that create an unacceptable risk, such as government-run social scoring of the type used in China are banned. Second, high-risk applications such as CV scanning tool that ranks job applications are subject to specific legal requirements. Lastly, applications not explicitly banned or listed as high risk are largely left unregulated. Okay. Um, in terms of organizational uh, exemplars, I'll, you know, I'm just putting a statement uh, here from you know, you know, introduction of a framework that Cisco developed and Cisco has collaborated with and been in conversation with Ford Foundation in the sort of uh, PIT arena. And it goes something like this. At Cisco, we appreciate that artificial intelligence can be leveraged to power an inclusive future for all. We also recognize that by applying this technology, we have responsibility to mitigate potential harm. That is why we have developed a responsible AI framework based on six principles of transparency, fairness, accountability, privacy, security, and reliability. And then as you look at some of their additional policy statements and documents, you see that they're making an attempt to operationalize some of this. So finally, let me talk about um, the sort of, um, uh, I guess, last pillar on my, on, on my introductory slide, um, academia. So one of the things that the movement has done is that in terms of the sort of cross-sector collaboration, they have encouraged and invited um, uh, universities around the world um, to both individually and also collectively start embracing, start discussing and start moving the PIT conversation forward. So to date, in my understanding, 48 institutions have joined that uh, network. Um, the sort of other uh, encouragement that has been offered here is to look at these institutions when they commit to this uh, network, adjust their own ecosystems um, so that they can deliver on this interdisciplinary um, approach, if you, uh, if you will. Um, so, you know, one of the things that is happening in the conversation, for example, is that when we look at where and how individuals are being trained who eventually find themselves in leadership positions in the technology world. Unlike fields of law and medicine, for example, very little was happening with few exceptions on the ethical training front. So now this commitment, um, especially from this group that I'm talking about, but then beyond that as well, as education institutions are thinking about some of this with intentionality, whether they are using the PIT umbrella or some other digital responsibility um, uh, yardstick, if you will, that sort of that is one of the areas of focus, and I think that has a lot of potential in terms of um, the sort of pipeline of of technologists and technology leaders as they then come out with a different kind of training, their 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 their, uh, uh, their potential to hopefully do things differently, mm -hmm. and of course joining the network is anchored this invitation there to sign on to sort of seven commitments. And, I, and I, I'll, I'll, I'll put some of these things in our chat in a, in a few min, minutes, minutes in, in, so that you can access some of these, these resources. So just a quick, uh, then again, a flavor of how under the uh, public interest technology movement, some of these things are moving forward. So uh, at this point, just one more time, what is at stake in terms of digital responsibility? So I take you back to uh, Shoshana Zuboff, Gerard talked about, some of you are familiar with her work. We have also provided a couple of links about some of her conversations. This is what is at stake. I'm a distinct, I'm a distinctive human. I have an indelible crucible power within me. I should decide if my face becomes data, my home, my car, my voice becomes data. It should be my choice. That is what is at stake. So let me um, stop here and stop sharing my screen. And at this point, we again welcome 
a couple of comments or question either in our chat box or here on the Zoom screen as well before we move on a little bit. That's a great question, Isabel. Um, it's, it's about operationalization, uh, isn't it? And as I said, that I'll, I'll share a little bit more about their uh, work through a, through, a, through a link. So with that lens, you should look at some of their expanded documents on how they're arguing uh, that this is, this is how the work is being uh, approached within their organizational setting. So good, good, com good question, good comment. Let me also say that, you know, um, uh, um, in terms of possibilities, PIT is one conversation that I chose to focus on, right? Secretary General of the United Nations, many of you are familiar with the UN Global Compact. The Secretary General has now invited the global community to start uh, through a process of consultation to come up with what would be eventually, I think, labeled as the Digital Global Compact. So I think there's a, there's a gathering in 2023 uh, where then um, uh, consultations, just not from you know uh, tech specialists, but all stakeholders, including civil society uh, from around the world, uh, will contribute to what should that digital compact uh, look like. Um, and then there is a, I believe, a UK-based uh, group, um, Digital uh, Social Responsibility. They are doing some really interesting work uh, in this uh, regard. Um, Center for Humane Technology, we will hear about them in a little bit. Um, they, in, fa in fact, if you, if you are not familiar, they actually developed a course called Foundations of Humane Technology, which is open to the world, thanks to their sponsors. And they are, they are hoping that they will reach about 100,000 uh, individuals, leaders and practitioners from around the world in the coming months and years with the help of that course to move the, the conversation that we are having forward and, um, and bring more and more people under this umbrella of uh, digital responsibility. Any other comments or questions? I'll add a quick comment. Thank you, Gerard, for your presentation and Akhil for yours. In leading up to preparing for this was when we first started talking together and there were many choices to be made about what to focus on. And we admitted none of us is expert on anything we'll share and start the conversation. So we literally are role modeling what we expect in the breakout groups. And listening to you, I had the same reaction that Isabel has shared in the chat to say, this is overwhelming. This is a lot of information, a lot of change everywhere. And I know um, David is in the room. I mentioned earlier that he was, um, the former president of the US chapter of International Humanistic Management Association. And he's also the chair of the UN committee on bringing the arts into um, educate, um, management and you know, ran the transgenerative conference. And that was an example of how work that, you know, using improv or poetry seemed like marginal work when I started doing it a decade ago is now considered cutting edge and UN is sponsoring conferences on it and collecting the globe around that. So there's lots of opportunities. So all of us who are here today, thank you for being here because if it's overwhelming, it's good overwhelming because if you're willing to do the work, there's many, many more opportunities opening up every day because this has gone from being marginal work to cutting edge work. So thank you. Thank you, Jodi. There's one more comment from Damon uh, who, who's who talks about the biases in AI. Uh, Damon, do you want to raise that? I, th I think that's that's an important point that that uh, there's been a lot of uh, comments being made about how AI uh, generally has is it has involved biases and the the story of Timnit Gebru etc. Those are still those still on and and what the impact of that of those of those kind of algorithms is 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 a big question. So that's one more layer I think to add to this whole question of what is happening. Um, any other comments or questions? Max is here, Akil, so uh, we could go ahead with that if 
that is okay with everyone. Hi, Max. Any other questions or comments? Okay, shall we go ahead? Q? Yeah, so uh, just raise your hands if you think that, you know, we can do about 10 to 15 minutes of uh, this conversation and then take a break. I, I, are, we, are we okay with that? This I'm is for everyone. Some, I'm seeing some nods. Um, all right. Okay. Well, let me uh, invite Max in. Uh, let me first introduce Max. Max is an award-winning artist. Uh, named by Forbes as one of the best storytellers of the year and the Youth and Education Advisor for the Center for Humane Technology, an organization of former tech insiders dedicated to realigning technology with humanity, as featured in The Social Dilemma. If you haven't seen that documentary, please go and look at it, take a look at it. Before working with CHT uh, and Founding another organization Max has founded called Social Awakening, a nonprofit dedicated to helping teens, schools, and parents survive and thrive in this digital world. Max was a media strategist with an extensive background running social media for multinational brands and later work, working for a social media company where he designed some of the notification structures to distract people that he now raises awareness about. So he is an inside, he can give us that inside story. He, he has spent the past five years with 100,000 plus students, parents, and educators around the world about social media's impact on our lives and creating resources to help manage that impact. Max provides us a unique and much needed perspective on the role of technology in our homes, schools, and in our society. I want to thank Max for being here. This was a serendipitous thing that happened. Uh, I happened to receive an email just a couple of days ago based on a connection I think we made a long time ago. And uh, I said, Max, can you do this? And he said, yes, just two days ago. So I'm so grateful to have you uh, to, to have you join us, Max, and to give us your perspective on this. As we discussed. I'm glad to be here. I also just wanted to quickly check in. Is the background noise unbearable? If so, I can walk outside. I did sort of scrounge this together last minute. Can you hear me OK? I can hear you OK. I think we're all fine, yes. Perfect, OK. Okay, so uh, as we discussed, Max, we were going to do a little question and answer because of the last minute nature of this. So I want to go back to the Center for Humane Technology and, uh, you know, give us a background because I, I suspect many people here would not know fully in terms of the background of why the organization was started, why Tristan Harris and others co-founded this organization. Absolutely. Um, so it was pretty much a group of concerned former tech insiders who just did not like the direction things were headed, most of which was that some of the most brilliant engineers that um, were coming out of Stanford and all these schools were pretty much working on how do we grab and hold as much human attention as possible, even though nobody was waking up in the morning and saying, how much time can I spend on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, Snapchat, whatever it might be today. And there was this misalignment between the incentives of the people working at these companies and their users and the people using them. Um, and it was in that concern and watching all of the downstream consequences of that effect, what it was doing to our democracy, to our mental health, that Tristan and I and some others were wanted to create an organization, create a group saying, hey, we are not on board for the direction this is headed. And how can we build a better and more humane future? And that was the impetus for the organization. Thank you. So uh, why did, why, I guess that raises the question, why did you join or become part of CHT? And uh, why did you start Social Awakening? Yeah, um, for, so for CHT, I just, as soon as I met Tristan, I had never heard anybody so articulately and beautifully talk about the sort of subtle, nuanced, difficult to comprehend challenges we we're facing as a society. And I just wanted to help however I could. And um, I'm very proud of the work and the awareness that we raised there. Uh, right now, CHD has sort of become an organization that is much more focused on governmental change or how do you make sort of the, the big, what are the big levers they're very focused on that change the whole system. I just have a different sort of theory of change. I believe in like 
how do we help individuals? How do we help families? How do we help schools? And so we just had a little bit difference in terms of how we see going about to make the impact. I'm super glad that we both exist. But yeah, social awakening is um, has been my focus for the past seven years anyway, of just going and giving presentations to students, parents, educators, creating resources for students, parents, educators on how do we help navigate the digital chaos that we're in that is affecting every single aspect of teen life, re mental health, relationships, creativity, focus. It's just overwhelming and we need as much help as we can get. And so Social Awakening is specifically created to go into school, school by school, community by community, create resources and change minds and hearts about how social media is impacting our lives. Thank you. Uh, so uh, one of the things that we've been, as many of us here are educators in, in higher education, and one of the key questions I think is, uh, you might have noticed this, I'm sure you have, there's a proliferation of digital programs, uh, which digitization being it's digital marketing or a range of them uh, that are emerging because uh, they are, uh, they attract a lot of students. It, it's very, very good for enrollment. And a uh, question is how, how much do, you, uh, based on your awareness, how much do these programs really take into consideration uh, the ethical and uh, societal issues that, uh, that the, the whole industry is, either dealing with or not dealing with, depending on your perspective. I think what becomes so important is to not make the same mistakes that the tech industry made, which is that when you measure the simplest things to measure, which are maybe like numbers, number of students or likes, clicks, engagements in the social media world, sure, you can optimize and build digital systems that make those numbers go up. But is that actually the intent of your organization? Is that actually what you are trying to accomplish? Is that actually what you're here to serve and do? And so keeping yourself very like honest about, are we here, we're here to educate. We're here to help people learn and help people develop new skills. Are we doing that effectively? Right now, this is just not the same <laughs> as gathering. There's so, you know, over the pandemic, what a gift that it was that we could gather like this but having brutal honesty with ourselves about in what ways does this just absolutely fall short? And for the kids I'm working with, 100%, like asking teenagers to stay focused on school, on this environment, when every cat video that's ever been created is one click away, is just a ridiculous competition that you're going to lose. Um, and so kind of having a real honest understanding of what are we measuring? Are we trying to help human flourishing or human learning in X, Y, and Z ways. And are we accomplishing that? Was in-person actually better for achieving that? And now we're just building on this thing that is just sort of adding other numbers, but not actually helping people learn better. And I think having that kind of honesty is both hard because it's the easier thing to do to build and grow digitally where like the numbers can go up, but also I think so important for the integrity of what we're trying to work on. Well, what about the content of these programs in terms of uh, are they sufficiently focusing on the potential downsides and the, and the kind of ethical concerns that any developer should have about what he or she is actually developing? Uh, is, that, is that, do you see that as being sufficiently addressed by universities? Sufficiently addressed? Absolutely not. More addressed than it has been in the past, yes. And so, you know, progress happens slowly, but I think it's such a big and challenging issue that how do you accurately address or sufficiently prepare developers or designers or whatever it might be to enter into these worlds? It requires such a wide variety of skill sets and knowledge bases. Um, and I think we as a society are still figuring out exactly what that looks like. It sort of combines like human philosophy and neuroscience and design and develop like these are disciplines that people dedicate their whole lives to. And then also in some ways asking these individual engineers to have mastery over all of it is just unrealistic. Mm -hmm. And so what does it look like to prepare people going into these companies and to help them be at least aware of the concerns or empowered to make change or fight for change? That's definitely, I think, one key issue is what does it look like as we release them out into the job force and into the world? Like, how do we make sure that they, that they know we have their back and are empowered to actually fight for change within these systems? Because of course they can't do it alone. Okay, uh, one, one, one last question before I open it up. Uh, so 
based on, I mean, uh, I, I think Tristan and others and you have been at this for some time. So you have a vantage point over what's happening in industry and the practices industry in general. But, uh, but Frances Hogan, I think, came out with her whistleblowing less than a year ago. Is that right? I think so. Uh, yeah, so, so the, the issues persist. Uh, what, what prospects do you see moving forward? Is, is, are the key players in the industry, the big ones, paying sufficient attention to these issues? Has it changed? This is where it gets really tricky. It's a good question and it's a really tricky one because attention is on this issue more than it has ever been. Um, and this is where it turns into what kind of attention are we putting on it? Because you come in with regulatory ideas. And for me, the big question is, are these regulatory ideas actually going to create a better system, a system that works? Or are we just creating a whole mess of very new problems that are going to be very difficult to undo or might sort of empower authoritarians in the way that rules often tend to? Um, and so like, that's really tricky. I used to believe that like, I was like, Apple, why wouldn't Apple be like our best ally in this? They don't make their money off of ads and the same percentage as these other companies do. How amazing would it be if they could be the help center where we weren't just going to things that were five star rated on the app store, but how well things helped us with creativity or learning things that we later rated as meaningful or helping us make new meaningful connections, whatever those categories would be. It's a big question, but like what a beautiful world that could be. And I thought Apple could just be our ally in this. Over time working in the space, I've been disappointed at the way that big tech companies have responded. And it seems like they run into, there are people who care about these issues in the companies, but they run into inertia or it's just too hard. Or at the end of the day, they're being measured against their gross numbers and it just, it just falls through. And so then I guess regulators become a key player, but like I'm of the mind that like change happens slowly and we win over individual people at a time and need to create better solutions, paint better futures. Um, and that's, that's hard to do. And so it's, I think, who are the key stakeholders? Everybody. <laughs> and yeah. that's an unhelpful answer, but it is what I believe. Okay. Thank you so much. I would, if you don't mind, I'll open it to the, sure. to the group here. If you have any questions or comments for Max, please. Uh, this is an opportunity for all of us. Anyone? Go ahead, PJ. PJ has her hand up. Oh, hi, PJ. Go ahead. Sorry, I didn't see that. Hey, oh, no, that's okay. That's okay. It's tricky, the Zoom thing sometimes. So, Max, thank you so much. And I just had a quick question because I understand you know, your background in storytelling. And one of the things that I'm always struggling with, right, is we have students that come in and so, you know, come into college and they have this whole, you know, storyline about capitalism, right? The storyline about what it is to be a business student and a business major. And I'm trying to find ways to help them change that story, to change that narrative, so that as they go from you know, freshmen to seniors through the school of business, that they can kind of grow out of those outdated stories that we still kind of believe in, right? So I was just wondering, like from a storyteller perspective, what are some things that we might be able to do to help start to expand their vision, I guess? Um, I think one thing that is very hard to do, and I honestly wish Center for Humane Technology had done more of earlier on, is to just paint the better vision. Because it's very hard to replace what exists right now without a vision for what, um, for what could be. And so I think in terms of investing energy in storytelling, if you're thinking about, okay, sure, this is how it works now with capitalism. And act has been really good in these ways and really bad in these ways. What would it look like to have an improved version of this or a new version of this. And, you know, it's the scary piece of where, uh, you know, the Marxism elements are very beautiful story that also kill a lot of people. Um, and so there's, you know, it, the storytelling is a challenging piece of this, but I think painting the better vision is something that actually allows people to really rally behind and be inspired to create a better world. Because it's easy to point at a problem. It's much harder to say, look, look at what could be. And that's where I find I get really inspired and where I've been successful at, at helping others do the same. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions, comments? Yeah, Joel, go ahead. 
Yeah, so uh, Max, I've been loving what you've been saying. Um, and you had, uh, if I recall, said that you, your choice was to kind of operate in the more grassroots level to try to help people um, think about this differently and better and do some things about it. Now, I found myself wondering, what can we as individuals actually do about this? Sure. Um, so, I mean, <laughs> I'll rally off a couple of things. In your own yeah. lives, some of the things people have found just like immediately most helpful, uh, and yeah. this is like just on the having a healthier relationship with technology, one of the simplest and most fulfilling things for people has just literally been buying a physical alarm clock, not letting your phone be the thing that wakes you up in the morning and have the very first thoughts that go into your brain be all of like the notifications and ways that you are behind um and physical alarm clocks are eight dollars on amazon for those who are using our phones as alarm clocks i'm pretty sure you can afford one um that is one another is turning off any notifications that is not a human being trying to reach you so none from getting you go into your settings it takes a little bit more doing but letting your phone only buzz if there is like a call or a text message and not letting any of that other stuff in and then, you know, as individuals, it's hard. But I mean, the work I'm doing with Social Awakening is going into schools, to middle schools, high schools, colleges, and trying to get as communities, groups to wake up and change the social dynamics and social norms of how we act and interact. I have pretty good ways of helping us realize, oh, hey, all of our students are using Snapchat to communicate, but let's all take a look at, the, I have, do this thing where I say, raise your hand if you use Snapchat, all their hands go up, keep your hands high if you have any kind of Snapchat streaks going, all their hands are up. Keep your hand high if you like Snapchat streaks, all their hands go down together. And they get to sort of look around and be like, oh yeah, we're all kind of doing this thing we don't like doing. Do we want to create new norms? Do we want to just communicate on other apps that are not trying to manipulate us um, and trying to help suggest some of those different kind of pathways and patterns. And it's a long journey and there's a lot of steps individuals can take. It's easier to do in community elements, um, but also I'll send you the link uh, to like the the best practices that um <laughs> that we that i've sort of outlined for an individual if you are curious about that shoot me an email anyone shoot me an email max at socialawakening.org uh, i can put it in the chat too but i'd be happy to to answer any questions or serve communities however i can yeah i would love seeing that max. thank you any other questions or comments Kathleen in the, in the chat says, is this a classic tension between corporations and commons? Are we on a hero's learning journey? I hope so. That would imply that we've got a, we've got a nice resolution coming. <laughs> um, I, I don't know. I don't know if we're on a, on a hero's journey. I'd really like us to be. Um, I think we're at a critical point for sure. And I mean, I'm very concerned about where we're headed. And I think, I think there's going to be some chaos before it gets better is the truth. And I hope that when it does, we can see each other, love each other and understand each other because I think it's getting harder and harder to look at anybody who does not have the same background or beliefs as we do and like actually listen and respect what they have to say and, and what they feel and to be able to lovingly have differences. And so I think that will be the, the courage that is required of all of us to, to disagree peacefully um, and to, to love each other even when we hate each other. <laughs> Thank Bernard you. has his uh, hand up, but uh, let me just say, I think I think we need we need thousands, not hundreds and thousands of heroes to work together. Uh, yeah. Whether we are negotiating, whether we are uh, pushing back, whether we are coming forward with innovations, so I think thousands and hundreds and thousands of heroes should be working together. Uh, Bernard. Yeah. Thank you very much for the great presentation, and when my professor was speaking, uh, Akil, he spoke about the health industry, that the health industry too was uh, seriously affected regarding this pandemic. And also listening to Max, I want to find out about the health industry. Did you touch in any way in the health industry? I mean, did you also come across anything about the health arena? that these days now the clients are being consulted electronically. What about that? What do we say about this? Ethically, I mean, seeing clients electronically. Do you what mean do like do doctors yeah. seeing patients online? Yeah. 
Um, Because in the health, you know, in my work with kids, what I'm seeing is anxiety, depression, self-harm, and suicide at unprecedented rates for teenagers. And that's horrifying. Um, In terms of, I actually, I'm honestly not sure of how, what the difference in results has been in terms of doctors seeing their patients online. Uh, From personal use, I would say like, in some cases, it's been so nice to be able to see a doctor over a over a device um, for like that first consult, if it's a dermatologist or something, hey, can you look at this? Doesn't look like a big deal, great. Like that convenience is something I've appreciated. Um, but that is interesting, I, I don't know. I don't know how um, how that's impacted that field. And I guess it does bring up, as with so many things, we won't have the data for that, for what? For five, 10 years in any kind of real way to really understand how it impacts. And that's another thing about this giant social experiment is that it changes so fast. And we don't, like, from a research standpoint, really know the impact for a very long time. And that's pretty tough when something is changing so rapidly. But yeah, I'm, I'm not, I, I don't have the data or have the expertise in that side of things. We'll find out, find out in, in years. And hopefully it's not catastrophic by then. Uh, just, just as a quick comment, though, I, I've noticed at least ads for a lot of, uh, mental health uh, online programs that have been popping up and uh, again same question I guess with regard to that and whether it's effective or not is, is really a, a question we need to think about yeah and I bet it'll vary heavily right some will probably be quite good at it and others will probably be really awful yeah yeah uh, thank you but the issue is we are also talking about we need the human touch the human feelings because we need to be face to face even that alone takes away the isolation but then if we are still going to continue on a uh, consulting doctors physicians nurse practitioners and all those people online or electronically then I, I, I believe we are going to compound the situation so if it's possible I, I would think that at least if it's possible we should come face to face using these uh, mask and other things so to come to face to face but then if it's critical that maybe we can do online that's my take on that yeah thanks for sharing thank, thank you. you bernard are there any other questions otherwise i i think we're kind of hitting a break now uh so is that a, okay okay and jody we should uh we should take our break now uh, I, I really great. want to thank Max. Uh, I will be seeing you this Thursday. Uh, staff has set up an appointment for us. Perfect. <laughs> uh, but thank you really so much for doing this. I think you provided a perspective uh, from a very practical insider, somebody who's dealing with these things on a real-time basis, uh, and particularly your last point about mental health of young people and loneliness. And uh, I think that that's a clear example of, of the impacts of these things. And uh, we need to pay a lot more attention to that. So really, thank you for being here and sharing your experiences. Thank you for having me. And yeah, I put my email in the chat. If anybody wants to know more about the work or wants to work together, just shoot me a note. Um, yeah, it was good to be here. Thank you all for putting your time and attention towards this and hope to see you again soon. Thank you. Bye-bye. <clears throat> uh, so uh, shall we take a, a break for about 10 minutes? It's 2.29 right now, maybe come back at 2.40. Uh, and uh, at, at that time, we will break up into groups. There are 33 people here right now. So I would suggest we do maybe five groups. Uh, yeah, that's the, that's the plan, Gerard. And uh, I, I know not that not everybody is on the East Coast, so calculate your time accordingly. Otherwise, you'll be gone for several hours if you just that's go to right. Gerard. Yeah. So, so just be back in 10 minutes exactly. Is that OK? Uh, stay, stay connected. I mean, uh, just, just mute yourself, go and stretch, do whatever you feel you need to, uh, and, and come back in, in, in exactly. Some voices. And being some signs in that in that regard. Um, <clears throat> Gerard, do you want to just take us through, you know, two or three of the questions that we were yeah. thinking uh, about? I will, I will post the questions on the chat as well as display them on a slide. <clears throat> oh, sorry, I posted only to you, Akhil.
And let me share my screen. Yes. One moment. I thought I had it open, but yeah, here it is. Can you see it? Yes. Okay, so you see from the questions, those are the three questions we thought we would focus on. Uh, what are the critical themes or additional considerations you would like to add to the conversation? And this comes from the idea basically that, you know, it's that, that that we're all looking at the same phenomena, but we construct it and see it and make sense of it in different ways. So it's very likely that there, with the richness of the participants here, we'll have more perspectives on, on the topic at hand. Uh, but we also want to get into action. So there are two kinds of areas of action that we would like to, uh, to focus on. Uh, basically, from an action point of view, what are the next steps that uh, the uh, International <clears throat> Humanistic Management Association can take to further the kinds of issues or addressing the kinds of issues we have raised here today? And again, what are the further issues we need to raise? So how do we get this into actually influencing and having impact in the field? Uh, for us, for the at least for the academics among us, is I would think for me it would be how do we influence the content of digital programs that our schools offer, and there could be many other areas in which we could have influence and have some action. Uh, and then personally, uh, uh, Max did talk about things we could do personally, but also in furthering the cause. How do we? actively impact the field as, as individuals, either in research, in teaching, or in other ways uh, that we can move forward. So these are the three questions we had for the group discussions. Uh, and uh, any, any questions or any comments on that? Yeah, Gerard, I, this is Ravi, Ravi here. Yeah, hi Ravi. Yeah, I just want to start off by saying that uh, uh, variance is an indis indisputable fact of life. Yes. And uh, that's really our problem with uh, our problem definition and also thinking about uh, the themes, the solutions, and where to do, where and what to do, and so forth. So I think, and it's a multi layered uh, problem, really. It's uh, mm -hmm. There are too many layers, there are too many contexts, the diversity, as I was saying, variance is indisputable. Uh, so you, you have to really infuse a little bit of systems thinking when you are thinking about problem solutions. Uh, a problem in US is very different from a problem in India. Mm -hmm. And uh, every time I hear uh, this whole uh, International Humanistic Management Association's discussions, therein lies the basic problem. We are talking about the whole humanity without recognizing that there are so many disparate, unconnected, very, very diverse, highly variable uh, subsystems in there under that broader label of humanity. Mm -hmm. So even Max's presentation, if you really look at it, he's really looking at uh, a, a system, you're focusing on a, a subsystem, which is very narrow in scope, narrow in terms of time, narrow in terms of uh, the students he's addressing, the, the customers he is uh, trying, trying to take care of, uh, and so forth. So I think the solutions, before we talk about them, we have to really talk about what system are we really defining for the solution to be. Otherwise, uh, it becomes such a huge universal problem definition, none of the solutions would really be applicable. So I just want to say, that you, have, you need a little bit of systems thinking, clearly identify what the unit of analysis is, and then talk about specific and relevant to that system that's defined, define the problem, then define the themes, define the considerations, define the system constraints, and then think about possible options for uh, evaluation and implementation. Okay. Can I comment on that? 
Sure. Yeah. Um, thank you, Ravi. It's always good to be mindful of the, you know, wide differences across the world, <clears throat> uh, cultures and countries about any any problem. I found myself wondering though, isn't this a manipulation of the social media, which are generally, you know, from pretty much the same cadre of, of, of players, of actors uh, toward manipulating us through, you know, for attention and surveillance. Isn't this pretty much universal everywhere in the world for everyone at every age level? Again, when you say, is it not universal? I would immediately say that perhaps it is, but the impact is highly variable. Maybe it is very much dominant uh, in America, but it's not so dominant when you look at other cultures and so uh, let, let me give you a specific example. WhatsApp in India versus WhatsApp in America. There are clear differences, even though you know that the technology has connected the society uh, a lot, but the way it is impacting is highly variable. So what you say is the solution in one country is very, very different in another country. I would say your general point is true. It's universal in impact, but the impact is highly variable. That's why I'm saying, talk about what system you're defining before you just talk about the trend. Could you could you be more specific about what the differences are, Ravi? Uh, differences are I, I just gave an example. What? Yeah, but India. that's that's at the input end. I'm asking about the impact. Yeah, impact. For example, the the cell phones have enabled the farmers, the rural farmers in India, to get the market prices readily. You know, uh, immediately they know what the market prices are in in uh, urban markets the rural farmers will not sell out to a wholesaler so that's a huge social benefit that the technology has enabled in india and uh, th that kind of benefit is not available in other countries for example in african countries you don't see that social benefit so all i am saying is don't talk in general terms. Define the particular system you're talking about before you say anything. Otherwise, it's so general, it's almost meaningless. Okay. Yeah, I think the, if I could just come in, Gerard, for a second. And absolutely, sure. I think contextual uh, sensitivity is essential. Right. Yeah. For about, for about, and you know, take 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 any sector from international development to the field of leadership studies, so forth and so on. I think. Um, questions of contextual uh, sensitivity and questions of contextual alignment they have been they have been along uh, they have, you know they have been they, they have been there for some for some time and there is increasing uh, attention that is being paid to paid to that and it will certainly apply to our conversation here uh, as well the way i sort of see this is that you know uh, starting point is what's the sort of you know big question and what do we what do we sort of know about an issue globally, and then think about it regionally and nationally and at the and at the grassroots level. So I, if I'm interpreting everything that Ravi is saying, I'm a little familiar with with both you know the power of uh, WhatsApp and how it was manifested, um, both in good ways and in challenging ways in India was different from other countries, especially the West, because people did not rely on WhatsApp the same way in other parts of the world. Um, but then when you zoom out, the question still remains responsible use of social media. Now, which media and, and it, what role it is playing, you have to look at it in sort of, you know, um, culturally um, sensitive uh, ways, paying attention to the national context. So for me, yes, you know, this is important, but there's no debate because I think we must be paying attention to, to both. Uh, and I always sort of give this uh, example, groups that I engage with that, we can't, we can't disagree with issues of access, whether it is technology uh, or education or justice for anybody, right? Any uh, age, any background. But the question always becomes, what is happening to that access in a particular context? 
and then you know obviously the solutions and so forth they need to be they need to be tailored there anyway i don't want us to spend you know too much of our time this is a, this is a good point and i think absolutely uh, should be taken into consideration so if, if it's okay maybe we should just see if other folks have uh, reflections about this or other questions and gerard maybe we can go back to full screen so that we can see each yeah, other sure. a little bit please Uh, yeah, Jyoti had a hand up. Jyoti, um, Akhil already said that. Okay. <laughs> I just wanted to be able to see people, um, oh, okay. and I've had a totally agree with Ravi and wanted to mention Michael Pearson is part of the Club of Rome, and systems thinking is very much what made us set this up as a workshop to say we don't have answers, but we can have the conversations in community. And then the final question that Gerard had shared was, what is each one of us willing to do? So Ravi, if you want to take that and create a dialogue with the India chapter of the Humanistic Association and gather the people in India, you enjoy that privileged position to be able to convene people to have the context specific dialogue maybe take some of this, maybe not, maybe generate new solutions and new contextual questions. Um, so it is really, action is at the individual level, but the dialogue and conversations are cross-pollinating um, possible solutions, possible ways of sense-making. Yeah. Uh, also, I, I mean, I, I kind of fall into some of those other types of questions in this context of, more the dystopian view again. Uh, I think the good that you mentioned, uh, Ravi, not, not to minimize that at all. I think it's been very, very important in alleviating poverty in countries like India, where use of cell phone and media has been, has been really fantastic. It's also been really effective in many, many other types of social movements and social good. But the industry is using that as an excuse to continue to do harm. And so I think when we really talk about systems view, we also need to talk about it in that context of the interconnectedness of these different aspects of what they do. They're very capable at breaking this up into silos and pointing to the good and not pointing to not dealing with the harm. So we, we need to address that too. And I think bringing these two together, say acknowledge the good, we wanna keep the good, no doubt about that but we don't want to continue with the harm cause. So I think to me, at least that is the big question here. Okay, uh, are we staying in breakout groups or in this large group or? Yeah, okay. I'm thinking, uh, you know, we can just continue. Uh, we'll okay. Hear from, our, from you know, other folks if they have comments, or of course, you know, if, if Ravi has any any uh, additional reflections here. So, so uh, I think yeah. I think Ravi has raised one of those critical additional considerations, which is being uh, being more nuanced about location and about specific how it affects different kinds of people across the globe. I think that's that's really important thing that we need to put on the agenda for the future. In the spirit of um, designing the facilitation on the go, since you know we had two hundred registered yes. and we have twenty in the room, can I make a suggestion? Sure. Let's see if that works. So, in I really, really want to hear from everybody. I have a lot to say, but that's not the point. Yeah. So, what I'm going to suggest is we take a few minutes of silence and take click on the link in the chat window to the document that Gerard has created with the questions and those of us who are more comfortable writing and less comfortable speaking up or even if you speak up collect your thoughts by writing them down in that document answer any of the questions you want or start a new question or say what what brought you to the workshop what concerns you about digital futures what did you get from hearing our perspectives and once we have everybody collect their thoughts in the document then we might be able to find themes around which we can either break out or continue to have shared conversation 
but I really would consider this a failure if we didn't hear from each one of you. So without meaning to put you on the spot, um, I call for a few minutes of reflective time okay. and writing time because writing tells me what I'm thinking. So Gerard, can you change the access to make it edit allowed by everybody? We okay. all have viewing access, we don't have editing access. Okay. Just change us all to editors and then share the link again so we can all write in it. Okay, here's the new link. Sorry about that. No problem. Thank you for doing it.
I noticed a couple of folks are still giving their good input. So maybe another two or three minutes, uh, Jayoti and Gerard, how does that sound? Sounds great. Right. Sounds good to me. And if you're done writing, you can read what others have written and see what you want to discuss and who you want to engage with, what themes come up for you. Okay. Should we start looking at this? Jyoti, do you want? I just need 30 seconds to finish reading. OK. <laughs>
Wonderful. Let's bring in the power of our voice and breath. And if some of you will read out either what you wrote or what somebody else wrote that appealed to you, we can start the dialogue. And if there are themes that you see and would prefer to discuss in smaller groups, we can create that too. For me personally, starting the conversations, self-awareness, and taking responsibility for our own behavior so we can model it for our students were the ones that resonated. I frankly have a challenge with um, you know how much dependent on technology I have become as I look at the list um, and understandably so I see that folks have committed to some very specific simple but meaningful things you know you know my relationship with my device um to then engagement at the sort of organizational and uh, and uh, and larger levels and i know that someone had sort of earlier asked you know sort of where should we take action so i mean it's, it's it starts with us right um self regulation right and then of course uh, given in so many ways what we are uh, tackling Collection, collective action is needed as well. So I see, I see some of that surfacing um, in what folks have, um, folks have provided as their input. Yeah, <clears throat> in terms of broadening the theme, I thought, I thought some really interesting. One is. <clears throat> The two things that I thought were are interesting in terms of particularly in context of social justice, one is the question of the digital divide. Uh, people getting having access and and that is a huge question with regard to uh, to social justice and to an access to to basically make a living uh, and, on the other hand, it also opens up the same people to to surveillance. Uh, and and the possibility of being surveilled and being becoming subjects of, of from, from whom data is extracted, uh, and I think there's an interesting question there because uh, one of the organizations I talked about, uh, Humanity, is actually talking about uh, the monetization for yourself of your data. So if you choose, you can, but you own the data and you. Uh, and you basically, if you choose to share it, if you choose to make it part of some big database, then you get paid for it, not the company that's extracting it from you. So uh, there are those types of solutions out there which possibly could lead to, uh, I think the big question is the, the powers in place today and and what what that involves but i think that's a really important question the other big macro level kind of theme is the one uh, ravi had talked about earlier that solutions will vary across across disciplines across the, in geographical and other types of boundaries so so what 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 does it mean in that context uh, and i think that's that's an important area What about everyone else here? Any anything that stands out for you? I have two specific things to ask of people in the room. Um, one is a response to Michael Pearson's idea that we create a special issue or an edited volume. If we were to do that, what would your desired chapter to read or to write 
in that collected edited volume B? What would you write about? How many of you are willing to consider that? And what would you want to read about? Uh, and um, before I call on one of you, because I'm gonna use my improv trick and say, I'll call on you and then you call on the next person. So we at least get to hear, since you are here and we want to hear you. Um, I want to also take 30 seconds to thank Ariane. She's in the room silently unacknowledged, but this workshop would not have been possible, but for all the hard work Ariane put into yes, organizing absolutely. Thank us. you, <laughs> thank you. Creating the event bright, advertising it, getting the links out and holding us accountable. So the power of community is my self-commitment doesn't hold till somebody holds me accountable and Ariane's been that rock. Yes, I second that. Thank you very much, all of you. Thank you. Ariane, you get to tell us what chapter you want to write and what chapter you want to read, and you can pass it on to the next person you want to call on. Okay. Um, well, for me, it's um, there's such an explosion of data, and um, I think people are overwhelmed, especially young people, in terms of uh, figuring out what's relevant, what's irrelevant, sorting through all the data. It's very time consuming. They have to go through a lot of information and most of it is a waste of time uh, until they get to what they need to get to. So it's, it's a matter of like figuring out what's trustworthy data, what is relevant data, what is useful and, uh, filtering, having some sort of filtering system. So I want to hear how people are experiencing explosion of data and how they're handling that. Okay. And I will pass it on to per person I see on the screen and camera's not on, Ravi uh, Chinta. I'm not sure if he is here. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> So what is it that I am supposed to say here? Uh, my, my my views on this is that, okay, can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Yeah, I'm uh, increasingly getting more and more concerned about the uh, technological sophistication that is going on in the digital technologies as they are evolving. For example, last week in the 60 minutes, there was a short documentary on deep fakes the deep fakes are uh, you know the avatars that look like the real personality you know like tom cruise uh, avatar is so realistic that uh, there is very little distinction between the real tom cruise and the fake avatar tom cruise so the technologies the digital technologies are increasingly getting more and more sophisticated and i'm really concerned because uh, that will really confound the factual reality with the fake reality and we'll all be more and more and more and more confused about, you know, Arian's point really, what is fake and what is real, uh, uh, we will really not know. So that really concerns me deeply. So something, I really don't know how the, the problem will be resolved. But uh, when I saw the documentary, that hit me right in the face. I always thought video is the best evidence because the person is there and you, you can easily say that he's caught in the act. <laughs> but nowadays, with the deep fake technology, I don't know what being caught in the act really means. So that's, the, that's what I have to say. Yeah. Thank you, Ravi. Who would you like to invite next? Uh, next is... Uh, Okay. Joel Harmon, he had some good points to make. Joel? Yes. Uh, thank you, Ravi, I think. <laughs> um, what, what, what's the question in particular? You can just share what's on your mind. There are many questions related to personal action, books you might write or chapter you might write or yeah, response yeah. to what you're hearing. Uh, years ago, some years ago, not that long ago, uh, I read a short sort of a science fiction story about uh, a guy who actually got sucked into a rebellion because it was a world where uh, you had a, 
an Alexa personal assistant in your life who is monitoring everything about you, from your, your physical heart rates and well-being to what you ate, what you did, what you said, and infer what you, what you really wanted to have a great life, to be happy. And it was making suggestions about what to eat, uh, who you might go on a date with. While you're on the date, it's monitoring them and you at the same time, suggesting what to say to them to be successful in the relationship and so on and so forth. And we make suggestions about what you needed to buy, what you needed to get, where you needed to go, what you needed to do. And it was there all the time in your life. And it seems like not that many years later now that the, this world of technology, I'm being made more aware by, by learning more about what's going on behind the scenes, is getting closer and closer to that. And what, what the, I think the theme was about is about how seductive our desire, our need for convenience and sense-making in an increasingly complicated world uh, ha has become and how un unlike this particular individual, for most people, they were perfectly content letting the system know everything about them and use uh, you know, what we call now AI algorithms to figure out what, what's, in, what's in the best interest, what we want and what we need and how they had given up that autonomy in their life to this, um, this ever-present system. It wasn't like a big brother who was trying to hurt you. No, it was an aide who was trying to help you to make your life better. And that was the just totally seductive part about it. And yet most individuals had given up, if you will, that privacy and that autonomy to have this entity, this a, a, a digital intelligent entity in their lives uh, as assistant, except that there was a small relatively, but growing cadre of absolute rebellious terrorist people who wanted to assassinate the leader of this one organization. Uh, we might look at it as the Google, you know, back then, okay? who was essentially responsible for this and taking this over and to stop this at any cost. And you know the, the story went on to all the plotting and so on and so forth, and how the leader of this organization, despite everything, including taping up and disconnecting every technological feed in their lives so they could operate with some autonomy, somehow knew and expected this to happen anyway. So anyway, a long story, I'm sorry, but this, this conversation presents that for me uh, from, from years ago, uh, maybe a dozen years ago or more, okay, as, you know, the, the, the path that we're on. And it leaves me, you know, when Sharon said, uses the word dystopia, but it, it leaves me, you know, um, I don't know, having this, this sense of powerlessness, if you will, to some extent, because of the powerful forces uh, in our own desires to have sense-making and convenience in this you know, maddening and complicated world and where it just seems this trend is going. And so uh, I, I, I guess I'd be very interested in uh, personally connecting more with groups like Social Awakening to explore uh, for myself and as a, an educator, as a mentor, as a you know, guide uh, for, for, for students and colleagues, how we can begin to take steps to, I don't think eliminate, but let's say slow down and maybe make ultimately less destructive to our own free will and struggle you know, the struggle is good to some extent, right? So, you know, uh, if the search for convenience uh, and, and, and sense making, you know, is making it too easy, what can we do? This is a big, now for me, a perplexing, perplexing question. And so for us to be able to collect um, 
insights. Share that. Be agents for that. Seems to me a calling that I'm feeling. Sorry if it takes so long. It's your fault, Robbie. You should never call on me. <laughs> Who would you like to call on next? Oh, geez. I don't know. Um, Elif. Who? El Elif. Is it Semic? Semic? Yeah. Well, I'm not sure how to pronounce that, but uh, I'm seeing her uh, thoughtful face, so I thought I'd call Hi. Her. Hi. Elif Demek. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. Um, I will try to <laughs> catch up with you since I joined you a, a bit late because I had to join in another meeting. And um, actually, I guess the speed of digitalization has stolen our tranquility and our stillness and our ability of contemplation as well. Um, because um, with, uh, with the um, digital platforms that we, uh, that we are involved in, um, we really, we, we feel that we have to catch up with everything. The life just, uh, the pace of life uh, just has speeded up and it's in increasing every day. And um, I guess mindfulness um, would be, um, could be a solution for this. And actually it, it is, it, we, and we have to create an awareness among our students um, and maybe we should we should um, integrate we should um, integrate new lectures and uh, on the other hand um, after the pandemic um, most of the universities uh, have provided their lectures um, by online platforms of course it's a good opportunity but it is an opportunity if you have the necessary tools and if you uh, are able, if you are able to get involved and in any community, but in terms of uh, economic um, e economic levels of the difference in economic levels of countries, it is also a problem. And I guess this also increases the um, gap between uh, emerging countries or third world countries and the developed countries. And apart from this, uh, I guess the level, the level of um, consent of manufacture, manufacture of consent, it has, uh, it has been reshaped by the digitalization um, because the, main the mainstream media has shifted uh, in the, has shifted to different platforms and I guess uh, we we as individuals are, are aren't um, aware how we are manipulated um, to, in the um, course of our daily life or how, how what we read, what we watch. And I guess this is also a problem of individual emancipation. And these are what I have to say. Thank you for Thank listening. You. And you have Olivia, the power, you have the power now. our next speaker. Okay. Um, uh, Gary Sharp. Is it okay if I choose you? <laughs> it's fine. And of course, people have the choice to pass as well. But of mm -hmm. course, uh, as uh, my colleagues have been encouraging, we just wanted to hear as many voices as possible. Uh, so if, but for some reason, you know, you are not ready 
that's okay as well. Maybe Ken Ishikawa. Sir. Okay. Uh, hi. Uh, <laughs> I'm just living in. I'm just in uh, in Japan. So time is uh, four thirty four a.m. So wow. I'm okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here. I, yeah, I'm sit up. Uh, for a long time, and so, but uh, actually, uh, when I when I when I uh, listen to our conversation, so, it, so something comes up in my mind, and one is uh, the what is the country will exist in our digital uh, society because we are in the virtual society, virtual community. Uh, from different time zone, different region. So this is a brochure, but uh, it's a, a real, a real uh, community for all over the world. So in that sense, what, how a country and a state will uh, function in the future? If, if, uh, Here's another example for me. Uh, frequently, I use a VPN connection. So when I click on the VPN connection in the US, Los Angeles, and New York, and the Singapore, and so French and so Paris, so I can easily uh, connect in the in the particular region. So so I can move around the world as a as a uh, residential a person. So in that sense, here's a question again, I'm gonna say again. So what country, what the state will exist in the digital society? And also uh, in that society, how we connect with e each other as a what uh, status. I hope we are going to create a new uh, global status, uh, global citizenship or global uh, some status. Here's my uh, reflection from our conversation. Thank you. And can you okay, can I ask can I ask a clarifying question just for a second uh, of Ken if you don't mind? Uh, I, I was just wondering about uh, the persistence or the or the the disappearance of diversity in culture. And yes, it's right. And uh, where uh, memes and and news, et cetera, is, has becomes less diverse and what people pay attention to becomes less diverse in the process. Is that what you're referring to? Yes, I understand. So what you yeah. are talking you. about, because the, here's a, a Japanese situation. When we, when I use uh, Facebook and uh, Instagram and uh, uh, TikTok or something in the apps, so I use a Japanese language. Mm -hmm. And so also when I click on the VPN connection to, to uh, make a connection or the global world, so I use uh, English as a uh, communication tool. And so jump into the uh, WhatsApps, uh, Facebook in English. So a global citizen can choose easily uh, which one is uh, better than uh, the other. That that means it's a global citizenship. Mm -hmm. mm. Interesting. Ken has to choose the next person, right? Oops. Mm. How can I pronounce it? But uh, Ariane. He already went. Uh, Ariane Sani spoke already. Yes. Hi, Ken. Good to see you. Um, I already spoke. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Can you speak of that? Oh. Can uh, Ariane already had a turn? Oh, okay. So could you so invite sorry. someone else, please? <laughs> Thank you. Okay, next to her. 
the the Diogo Diato. The the Diogo. Diogo. Hmm. Okay, we can go on to someone else. Okay. Okay. What about? Uh, could you please say about something, Diana? Hello. Hello. Um, I'm sorry, I cannot connect uh, my camera. But uh, yeah, I just wrote in the chat, uh, I wanted to thank you all for the event and the conversation. I think it was very interesting. Uh, I was telling you guys that, uh, yeah, I, I joined the, the event because I'm a human resource management uh, professor at a business school in Europe. And uh, I was very, I'm very curious, uh, you know, eager to know more about how other professionals approach these uh, uh, challenges. Yeah, I was a bit or looking for opinion. Uh, um, yeah, with it, it might actually from the ethics related with the technology and with digitalization. And concern about, uh, yeah, how conversation it's breaking do down. so uh one of the sorry can you it, hear it's me it's breaking up we can't hear you very clearly ah sorry let me see if here you hear me better so um so i was saying that i create these conversations with my students in my classes and when when what I find out is that, yeah, there are no answers or clear answers to me to, to bring them, you know, and many times they ask for them for the final answer. So what should we do or how we, I don't know, how we can avoid bias when we are doing a selection process, for example. So I give them some tools and uh, I try to do my best, but I was yeah, looking forward for more information, uh, maybe on your side as well, and some of the ideas you, you brought. I thought uh, they were very interesting, and I was checking the, the Word document as well. And uh, yeah, I'm going to check that movie, one that one of you was suggesting as a good tool to use in class. Uh, and yeah, that's, that's me and why I'm here. And, yeah, my view on, on the topic. Can you Can call you... on somebody? Sorry? Can you call on the next person? Ah, uh, yeah. Um, I'm not sure who's next. Whoever you choose. Ah, mm -hmm. okay. So Michael Person? Michael? No, I think Michael is not there. Uh, Mylene Cosbert. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Um, I wouldn't be saying much this evening because I joined very late. Um, I was interested in what um, Elif was saying, more or less. You know, uh, most of the points that she um, put over, I agree. Um, me in myself, I'm literally an observer along in the group. I'm not in the education industry. Um, but I am very curious about, um, yeah, how technology fits into our society and how even us and our children, you know, um, can learn from it and so in a sense if if we're not certain ourselves you know what is it that we're putting over to you know the younger ones um there is a lot out there that um they themselves are acknowledging you know but how do we control have control over um the intake 
of what they are processing. Um, and so, as the last speaker was saying, you know, um, sometimes they will come up with certain questions, but do we have the answer, you know? So it's, it's fantastic to have a community like this, you know, um, who is um, raising all of the, these um, questions and concerns and, you know, um, trying to incorporate certain things in our community um, globally, you know. And as I said, um, I will remain an observer because I, I will be honest as well. I, I'm scared a bit, you know, about the way technology itself, you know, where it's going to. You know, so it would be interesting to learn from what we gather. Thank you, Meline. Yeah. And who would you like to invite? Right, because I was late, I don't know who has spoken yet. I will go through the um, group and see if, um, has Christine spoken? Okay, thanks, Meline. Okay. <laughs> and then thank you to uh, the organizers of this event. Um, one of which I live with. <laughs> and then, so we're on two different levels right now, uh, trying to make sure that our conversation doesn't clash. Um, but thank you, uh, Jyoti and Gerard and uh, Akhil and uh, Ariane and Michael Pearson um, for organizing this event. Uh, yeah, while listening to everybody, yeah, there's lots of things that went through my mind, um, but I don't want to list a whole lot. But one thing that I recall is a couple of years ago, I had a a blind student in my class. The first time I had a blind student and I didn't know, you know, I, I wasn't, I've never, I'm not trained to teach uh, in, in, a, in a classroom with, with uh, to, to somebody who is blind, but the student was the best student in the class. Um, and uh, I offered a research pro, a, a project and the student, this student wanted to do it. So I said, what would you like to do? What What's the topic? And happened to be an accounting student and I was teaching economics, uh, macroeconomics. And the student said, well, I want to see how we could use digital technology to alleviate poverty um, and, and help students in poverty learn and succeed. And that's what we actually did. Um, and then another student in another class who was a, a tech person and wanted to do to do the do research, but was excluded from doing it because his GPA didn't meet the criteria because we have these barriers to entry. Um, and so I put the two together and they helped each other out. And this student came up with a survey that uh, he ra ran through the college and, and the, the, the repeated response he got from students was, uh, one of the questions was, how do we use technology to be able to learn efficiently? So we have all this technology, but students are, don't know how to use it. So, so to me, that becomes an important um, um, aspect to help students um, go to the right sources, figure out how to use technology. The other thought that I had was also, it's, it's, it's so easy to learn how to use digital technology. Um, I wonder if we can find a way to help each other unlearn and relearn how to do it. Um, and so one way that comes to mind is, is going out into nature, right? going out into the, into the, in the open and listening to sounds, listening to birds, listening to you know, just watching the clouds as uh, Gerard has an Instagram page that he chases the clouds. And, he, and so, uh, you know, just watching the clouds and how they move and, you know, why do they move and, and having these conversations might be another way to get us off these digital devices and, um, uh, and, and, uh, and, and, you know, uh, reconnect with us as humans um, in a room even though we are in this digital space, as Ken uh, alluded to, uh, you know, and, and I think even Ravi and uh, everybody else in the room, uh, this has made it possible for us to still connect in this in this in this time of COVID. Um, however, we are in in little boxes, um, and 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 you know we can see each other's faces, but that's about it. Um, we we can't feel each other. We can't you know touch each other. We can't you know um, we can yeah, put all these emojis, which I'm still trying to learn about these different emojis and what they mean. Um, but 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 
those who are digital savvy, I'm pretty, you know, know, know exactly what that means. But so maybe getting getting us out more into the into the uh, natural environment, you know, uh, actually listening to sounds uh, would make would help us maybe get more responsible about what really we we engage in on, on in digital media. Um, and then that example comes up to mind. My, my I know, my, my, I was talking to my daughter last early this morning, and again we are in a different time zone. And she sent me a, 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 an Instagram tweet. Is that what it's called? Something that she found on a, a tweet. She said, "Well, I'm a little little stressed, but I hear something you might I I, I I want to share with you." And it was a picture. It was a video of of her mother bear with four cubs. You know, just jumping around, walking behind her. And every little while, the mother bear stood up on her hind legs, and she, and she was walking. They were walking alongside a river stood up on her legs and then looked out and then went back on her four, four paws and did about three or four times. And then the, we were talking and she goes, I'm just wondering, if I said, yeah, that's a really interesting video. I just wonder why the mother bear was standing up on her hind legs. And she goes, oh, I didn't know bears could actually do that. And I, and I also didn't know that bears have so many cubs. Um, and so I kind of recall, you know, some time ago in New Jersey where we live, um, there was this bear that had hurt his, his front paws. So he was walking around on his hind legs all around the town. And I forget the town it was, maybe those living in New Jersey might remember. Uh, and, and he was walking around house to house in people's yards. And, and finally, uh, I think somebody shot the, 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 with a bow and arrow. And so we learned, well, I didn't know they use bow and arrows either uh, to, 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 to shoot down bears. But, but that was, uh, and, and then we, a few years ago, there was a, uh, is some, a bear that entered a, a backyard and in a pool and had five cubs swimming in this backyard pool. And, and so I, 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 the thought went through my mind, how quickly we forget these things because we're so engrossed in these, in these memes or messages that we hear or videos that we see that we forget that, that you know, um, the real knowledge comes from actually experiencing things outside of the digital media. And so that's to me uh, something that maybe we should try to do more of and help our students do more of. Um, and I'll stop there. Thank you. We'll choose the next that. person. Oh, um, let's see. Sally, I think is. Uh, Bernard? Oh yeah. That's actually um, Ivy, Dr. Ivy Seki, I think she's using. Oh. Yes. Yes, there <laughs> Hi, Ivy. Yeah. Hi, thank you very much. Yes. This comes to mind, uh, I was in Ghana and I was asked to make some presentation. And the, when, during the pandemic, the students were taking through this, the students were taking through, I mean, the electronic, But they were taught, I mean, some were taught online, some were sent home because there were many, they didn't want so many people in class. So they were going in batches. So what happened was some didn't, most of them were using their smartphones. Others didn't have smartphones. So it means they were denied or they didn't have access to the lectures that were, were going on. So what happens? So I was asking a whole lot of questions. I said, so what did you do? So it means those who were sent home, they, they will be coming in a different uh, period or different times. Those who were there, some were able to access, some were not able to access. And so it means there the, the was, deficiencies in the resources. So what came up was, we have to increase the resources for the students. Those who didn't have, they should give them maybe a, a tabletop computer so that they could also, or the school should have a, a tabletop so that those who don't have uh, laptops or those who don't have smartphones can access the table, that computer, the tabletop. So, here comes to mind, the, the tutors or the lecturers themselves who were also teaching, they were also not computer savvy. They were not trained because this pandemic just came up. 
it was just something that was taken just on a waste. So they were not trained. And so they were also fidgeting. They had a hard time of taking even the student through. This was a nursing and midwifery training colleges. So what happens? They needed to use other simulations and all those things. In Ghana, most of them don't have that simulations to take the students. You know, the nursing and midwifery student, they need to do some hands-on. If so, if even they had simulation, they could learn better with these simulations. And if in, even if the, uh, the tutors or the lecturers themselves don't have access to that, how do they take the student through? So these are the issue where uh, Ravi was saying that uh, in the context that not all the countries, not all the nations have access to these uh, information or the highly sophisticated information systems. And so when we are taking decisions, then we need to take the, we need to consider those deficiencies that not all the, the schools or not all the colleges, not all the countries have so many or have resources that can take the, their students through. So here is the case that even in the, uh, during that pandemic too, when they were asked to go home, the purchases that they have even done concerning the perishable ones, they couldn't also even sell. They didn't do anything. They were made to rotten. So here is the case that they were even uh, having less resources and yet some even went waste. So in, in this regard, what do we do? What I will suggest is we need to uh, increase resources in, in most of the institutions. And at the same time, we should also institute this uh, privacy and confidentiality so that not all the information will have to will have to go out or we need to protect the information that we put out there especially those of us doing researches and other things they just we just leave everything for everybody to just uh, take whatever they want and so if we are able to put some systems or whatever in place to protect the information that we keep also in, in the social media. At the same time, all what the suggestion to that I will, the, I will put out there is to train the professors and the faculty members because they also not or even the students alone having not uh, accessing the information but the tutors or the lecturers or the faculty members need to be trained in these highly sophisticated areas so that if there is another pandemic or since we are still in this pandemic area uh, or era they will be equipped with the necessary skills or tools to go through their work efficiently so this is the little that I will I will offer. Thank you for the opportunity. Thank you. I want to be <clears throat> respectful of everybody's time. Yeah. Thank you for being here. It's two minutes to closing time. Sally and A haven't had a chance to speak yet. So in the next two minutes, we get to hear from them and the closing comments from the panelists. So if I have permission for people to go a few minutes over time so that we can accommodate everybody, that would be great. But if you need to leave, thank you for your patience and giving us the time. Uh, it's been a pleasure listening to you. Sally or A, either one of you can take the floor. And if you again want to be an observer and a listener, that's okay as well. Just making sure that there is space uh, for everyone to say a few words at least. Okay. Okay, I think we can go towards just a few quick words from the panelists, uh, if that's if that's all right. Um, I'll I'll start because I think yes. one thing which has been sort of um, standing out for me in an, you know, I think a number of comments that were made 
is, is this idea of digital divide that we are very familiar with. Um, but I think I just want to, to, to name that because I think even during this gathering, I've asked myself a few times, including when I was talking about um, you know, public interest technologies, right? That who is not here? Whose voice is not being heard? So I think sort of that's my, I guess, final thought in the sense that even with that commitment, when we talk about resources, when we talk about multi-stakeholder engagement, when we talk about dialogue, I think sort of really reaching out and encouraging those voices which have been silenced, it requires a lot of uh, intentionality on all of our part. So that notion that has been around of digital divide is extremely important. And as many observers have said today, the speed and complexity of digital, digitalization um, increases exponentially. The issues around that divide are even more urgent. Thank you everyone for joining, appreciate it. Shyoti, you wanna go next? Uh, I'd rather you. Okay. Uh, you know, uh, if, if any of you got to watch that frontline uh, video to our video on artificial intelligence, one of the comments made there is data is the new oil. Uh, and in terms of the power that data has and its implications for society. And so there is a competition for data because it's, uh, it's the raw material for artificial intelligence without data that doesn't. But there are lots of problems with it as we've seen in terms of diversity and in terms of uh, biases, in terms of uh, uh, sometimes false, science like uh, the recognition of emotions on people's faces, uh, questions like that. So I think the guardrails really need to go up. Uh, we need to play a major role in that. And uh, I really want to thank all of you for being here and being part of this conversation. I really hope this is only the beginning of, of something where we can have real impact in a positive kind of way, not losing the good things about the technology, but yet making sure that it is uh, it is in the interest of society and humanity, uh, wherever we might be, and uh, as we move forward. Thank you very much, Jyoti. Thank you. Thank you to Gerard for initiating this and for everybody at IMA supporting it. Since I said I don't have the answers, I'm just going to share a virtual lighting of the lamp. My name Jyoti literally means the flame of a lamp. <laughs> so you keep my light alive by sharing in community. I love that the lamp had multiple lights. Uh, we may be each be the torch bearers of whatever we care about and support each other in our journeys. Appreciate Thank your you. time, your careful listening, your thoughts. And I look forward to building on this with books, special issues, articles, more conversations, and hearing about the actions that you take. I committed to um, showing the movie Social Dilemma to my students and colleagues and having a conversation around that. Thank you, Jyoti. Uh, Ariane, do you want to give us a last word? Um, I wish everybody <laughs> a great rest of the day, evening, uh, morning, whatever time zone you're in. And thank you all for joining us uh, for this uh, very interesting and uh, productive session. Thank you, everyone. Thank, thank you, Ariane. Really thank you, everyone. Appreciate it. And hope to see you again as we as we move forward with this topic. Thank you. Bye-bye.